Um, and I think there are two really interesting strands of VR experience at the moment, which is what we're talking about here a lot, which is kind of uh, film-driven VR experiences, um, stuff that is using the tools of VR to look in really interesting ways to tell narratives in really new ways, really interesting ways. Uh, and then we have the games, which are people here that are doing really interesting things with interaction and how that can also enhance both story and just the kind of things we've been doing in games for years now. Um, uh, so, with that in mind, yeah, I would like to first ask, as I take the seat, um, what the first or most recent VR experience is that you guys have had that convinced you that this is an industry that you should work in or continue working in? And to give you some time to think, I can just quickly go through mine, which is um, a game from about two years ago uh, called Fate of the Silent Oath, uh, which is kind of a Game of Thrones type game. Um, lots of dark fantasy and stuff like that, and you go on an adventure, and uh, along the adventure, you uh, end up losing someone that is someone's daughter. And at the end of the game, spoiler alert, um, you end up talking to this uh, girl's mother, and she asks if she's still alive, and you have to tell her uh, physically with a shake of the head that no, she's not. And that was a moment for me that carried a lot of incredible emotional weight. Uh, in a game that wasn't necessarily the best written game, the best, the most emotionally involving game otherwise, but that one second there was enough to convince me that interaction and storytelling in VR is the next kind of uh, essential. So, yeah. Beat Saber. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, my mic on? Is it on? No, it's not. I'll take yours. Yeah, that's better. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to skirt your question somewhat, uh, and say that the reason uh, that we created the Infinite Hotel, or that we pitched the Infinite Hotel, uh, this was back in, I guess, 2017. It was that round of uh, Creative Europe funding we put it forward. And the reason we put it forward was because everyone was talking about this big new thing, VR, that was coming out, but I personally had not yet had my VR moment. And so, uh, as a company that we uh, like, we like to focus on snappy dialogue and character design and, and like real good development, <coughs> um, unpredictable plots, that sort of thing. And we didn't see that happening. There was a lot of early programmer graphics. There were a lot of you know a lot of uh, low poly sphere type work. And and we thought, well, maybe we're the ones that are going to drive VR uh, commercial narrative forward. And so that's where the Infinite Hotel came from. Like I said, the, the working against limitations and trying to be the, the first people to be there that changes the data to something new. So. Yeah, cool. Is it on? Yeah, it's oh, on. Okay. Right. I'll keep this. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah, for me, this is quite an easy question to answer, actually. <laughs> it's, I have a very clear moment in my life when I, if I wasn't convinced before, I was afterwards, uh, since I survived. So there's, there's a game called, and I'm a huge horror film fan. I mean, it's, it's the best thing I know to be shit scared, basically. And I played a game on PlayStation VR a couple of years back called Dread Holes. I'm not sure if you know of it, but it's, uh, in short, it's a first person exploration game where you basically explore a some kind of a gothic rural castle and you have these tight corridors. Uh, actually, it has those kind of uh, uh, statues that you uh, talked about earlier, that if you look away, they approach you. So you have to look at him while you're going this. But that wasn't my scariest moment. What happened was that I went into a corridor to explore. I found a dead end with a chest and nothing inside the chest. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just go back to my safe room in the open area on the other side of the castle. And when I turned around and then turned right in the corridor, I couldn't see the lights anymore in the open hall. I was like, there's something blocking this corridor. <laughs> and as I approached it slowly, it was a giant bloody pig with <laughs> big teeth just staring at me and doing this. <laughs> and the moment when I realized I am, you know, there's a dead end behind me. There's nothing in the chest, like a health potion or something. And I can't even fit on the side of the, of the pig, so I can't just run around it he is going to approach me and eat me alive. And I was so convinced that when he started running towards me, I just took my head off, heads off and I threw it away. I threw myself in the couch and screamed. <laughs> and I just loved every second of it. Because <laughs> I've never been so scared by watching a movie on a flat screen. Um, yeah, 
So it's, I mean, I was kind of already migrating from the flat screen gaming industry into VR gaming at that point, but it really sort of tipped me over and said, well, I, I, this, I have to explore this. So yeah, that was my moment. <laughs> um, for me, uh, well, um, playing stuff recently has been tricky because we're right in the end of development. Um, I also had twins about six months ago, which is Congrats. not easy to juggle with releasing a game. Um, I guess it, like the very first thing that really took me was this thing called Blocked In. It was just a single room with, uh, it's like a Russian apartment with Tetris blocks coming down outside, which blew my mind and convinced me 100% in it's being inside a set that someone has created, even in this illustrative, illustrative style, just, uh, it just, the, the possibilities ran away with me. Probably the most recent thing I've had time to play, because it's short, is Vader Immortal, um, the ILM Star Wars experience. Um, it's kind of linear, but and it's short, but the quality in it is brilliant, and um, the just the, if you feel like you're in an episode, and that was very inspiring. I mean, inspiring at the end of when I already pretty much made everything in Doc Two, but um, I think what they're doing with that in terms of taking something from the film world and translating it into an actual experience rather than a, a TV-based game. Um, it's very well done. So um, taking some of those those like kind of lessons and inspirations that you guys have had from those other experiences and of course working in the industry now for anywhere between what, one to four or five years, I guess, um, what are some of the kind of things you guys say need to be in a native VR experience, especially the ones that you're building now? Uh, I'll kick off. Um, I, think, I think keeping the word immersion in the forefront of your mind entirely. It's, uh, it's ensuring that uh, like what we have is a medium that we can look in all directions, we can touch things, we can kind of touch things, but if any time like you got to keep the, the the UI to a minimum. I think you were talking about this. The the, uh, the, the things on screen, the, the heads up displays, all those sorts of things that you're used to in a traditional screen-based game, um, have to kind of go away, and it has to be more intuitive. And the less you can break, the less you can remind a person that they are inside of a box. Uh, that's it, then you've won. I mean, I've seen people try to do it with navigation. You know, you do things with uh, with cockpits. I mean, locomotion is the main problem uh, uh, for for large scale games, where you've got it, you're limited to either a, a teleportation system, which reminds you every time you teleport that you're still in the room at home, or if you're in a cockpit, you feel like you're driving, and so on. It's all these tricks are uh, are there to get around the fact also that most games are wide. Uh, you want to play Legend of Zelda. Legend of Zelda is fields and mountains and villages, and they go on and on and on. And that's what impressive on a small screen, but if you try to transport that into VR Zelda with auto run, uh, you will lose the immersion because you're constantly reminded that you're not really there. Yeah, I think yesterday I actually had a look at our settings menu in our first game, mm -hmm. Apex Construct, and we have over 30 options mm -hmm. in the settings menu just to cater for all different play styles. Mm -hmm and to make sure that no one feels nauseous when moving around. There's teleportation, there's HMD-driven locomotion, there's snap turning, smooth turning. It's just, it, it, went, it came to a point, it was just crazy uh -huh. to have to do this because, you know, we, we developed our first game without free locomotion. We, we thought that let's just do teleportation because that, that make, we make sure that no one feels sick when playing our game. Um, we, then implemented free locomotion before launch, and the data shows that 52% or so play free locomotion and 48% play teleportation. So yeah. like, you can't really cut out any of this and keeping immersion in the game while catering for all these options. It's, it's a task because you really, you <coughs> ask the player to say, you know, spend time with, with numbers and digits first, and then go in and get yourself immersed in the game which is a huge challenge for us, but I, I, I really think that these bits have to work. You can't really do something half fast like, you know, just do teleportation and implement a poorly locomotion, because then you will have players who won't feel immersed. So I, I went to a talk once about VR locomotion, and they referred to the term VR legs, and yeah. people getting their VR legs. Yeah. And, uh, and whereas these guys put out game one, and they only had 
uh, I think stick run or auto run, and people got nauseous and people got woozy and all that sort of stuff, and they didn't like it. So they had to force in teleportation after that. Then when they put out version two of their game, they only put in teleportation because that's what everybody asked for in the first one, but two years had gone on, and the same audience went, what happened to the auto run? We got used to that. And so, you, yeah, you can't please everybody, but locomotion's always gonna be the thing that pulls you out of your bedroom. Or yeah, I mean, the question we always ask ourselves is, you know, would this game be as fun as a flat screen traditional video game? And if the answer is yes, we probably won't do it. Um, so we need to find those things mm -hmm. that makes it worth while creating this as a VR exclusive game because that's what we do. We, we focus solely on VR to make sure that all the interactions are top notch and uh, yeah, the immersion is there, so to speak, mm -hmm. to deliver an experience that you can't really get. If it's an emotional or if it's an immersional perspective, um, something that cannot be delivered in flat screen gaming. Mm -hmm. um, Marcus, you no, I was gonna. I think the guy. These are really important things. Um, I think it depends on what you're trying to do with the game as well. Um, for example, Doctor Who is for us is sort of problem solving and exploratory. Um, it involves some degree of locomotion, but where we can, we try to keep that reduced. Um, there's a few other little bits in there which are slightly different. Um, whereas, for example, Peaky Blinders, which we're doing, is a lot more almost like an immersive theatre one to one. In places, you are. It's all about characters building, uh, working with real emotions. And for example, uh, the one how you enter a room to meet a character will affect the way they see you. If you just knock on a door and you open and you open the door, they don't have a level of trust of you. If you just open the door, slam it open, and they will instantly be against, you know, have their back up or angry or scared or so on. So with that. It's, it's probably going to involve less movement, but be more about the subtleties of the interactions um, and the knock-on effect of that with another <coughs> person. Well, I mean, that was something I was going to ask about next, really, is, is um, the idea of storytelling in VR and looking at how traditional games tell stories. Often they are very similar to movies. They take control away from the player. Uh, we then watch a bunch of cutscenes, which just play out exactly like a movie. But I think we're discovering more and more in VR again that there are new ways to tell stories, right? And I think Marcus, what you were just saying there, gets at that a bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how you guys think VR flips the script on video game storytelling. Uh, it's tricky. Um, for, I suppose another thing, we, like with Peaky Blinders, we're trying to give you the sense that you're in the world of, of the show. Um, you're meeting some characters from the show, some new ones. Um, and how you you're sent on a journey, like a, on a mission to recover certain information and so on, and how you go about getting that is up to you, and you will have a knock-on effect from scene to scene. Um, it's different from film and TV. I almost think you you have to treat it as a new medium. It it sort of sits somewhere between games and film. Um, the other thing is at the moment. A big aspect of it is you're being placed into the role of the character or someone. We currently don't have the technology really in place to converse, and then as soon as we do have that, that's going to open a can of worms of okay, if you can speak to a character however the hell you want and expect them to answer back in character, that's just asking and a huge amount of um, the game itself and the engine and the work that goes into the writing. Um, so I, it, it, it's. For me, a lot of it's about figuring out who you, the, the role you take on as the, the player or the actor in this, um, and then take it out from there. Mm -hmm. I agree. Kevin, how's it done? Yeah. Oh, it's Kevin. Yep. Okay, it's Kevin. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say is Kevin, that uh, character interaction is something that's very important to you in your game, obviously, and I was wondering how you guys approach that. Well, the difficulty, uh, again, of VR, I, if I look back, sorry, is everybody here familiar, if I say LucasArts, uh, Monkey Island, Day of the Tentacle, um, or the Telltale games more recently, right? Most of the time in traditional narrative uh, game adventures, it's third person. There is a character, and you are the, the god that is pushing them around. And, in, and at times, they're your, they're your friend rather than you. You don't necessarily think of yourself as... Um, it's like Guy Vers Three Boys. He's the name of the character in um, in Monkey Island. But you and he have a relationship, and occasionally you'd say, "Guy Brush, go into that snake," 
and he's like, I don't really want to do this, but I'll do it anyway. So there's, there's that sort of dialogue play that happens through inner monologue and to the, to the character, sorry, to the, to the player. So they're two different people. Um, games like, uh, oh, first person shooters. Um, any first person shooter out there, you are embodying the main character, and as a result, you're silent and you're probably holding a gun. Um, so that's the only speaking that you do, unless you jump to a cutscene, which you see one minute play out between two people. Um, difficulty in VR narrative, you are first person, but again, there's the voice issue where you'd like to talk to them, and so you have to get away uh, around that. You'd like to have branching narrative, but the only branching narrative you can really do is like a, like a pop-up or a, a, a heads-up display where you have option one and two. The way we do it in the game is uh, you're, you're, uh, essentially you're an employee in this, uh, in this elevator who's supposed to be seen and not heard. And when people ask you, you can accept and reject. You can say yes and no. You can you take a job. All the dialogue from you is very simple, but the dialogue from them um, sort of drives the conversation because you're meant to be silent and standing in the corner. It's not ideal because you'd like to have the ability to be a dick if you want to be a dick or you choose the polite path or whatever it is, but you can sometimes do that with actions in our games, being able to... Like somebody says, can you take this package to the 100th floor? And you say yes, and you pick it up. And then you heave it back out into the hallway and you leave. And they can have a how rude sort of response to that, but it's your actions that are speaking more than anything else. And I think when it comes to VR, it's your ability to sort of mess with the world a little bit. How much of this am I allowed to break? And we're, again, doing our best to try to have the characters react. You know, we want them to, you know, if you, if you poke the character right. standing in the elevator next to you, you want them to kind of go, eh, or rub their arm, or kind of look at you, or say, can you let me off the next floor, please? Or if you, like, the difference between a poke and a smack, if we can tell the difference between those two yeah. things, we might have two reactions out of them, mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's the amount of action we allow. You can't spark a conversation or insult them because the option is not there. Yeah, there is a game, maybe you played it, called Impatient on PlayStation VR, who actually tried using voice. Um, oh, really? Action. Yeah, but it's very limited. <laughs> yeah. And you can't really whisper and record all the options, but it's, it's a starting point, I think it's quite interesting. For us, we spend a lot of time focusing on the narrative in our games, and being first person, like you mentioned before, we can't do really, we can't do cutscenes, we could, probably, but for us, it doesn't really fit in first-person VR games at the moment. So our solution has been to have this voice that talks to you throughout the game. In our first game, it was an AI who talked to you in your, basically, in your brain. <laughs> and in the second game now, the Curious Tale of Sort of Pets, you have your memories of your grandfather narrating over your actions. So when you push a character or you find an animal, he's going to say something about that interaction that, that triggers a memory or something like that. But the tricky part, though, is to keep the player focused on the narrative while being able to soak in and interact with all the world with the world at the same time. It's really thinking that's something we're trying to push now a solution for before we launch our game is that people actually miss the narrative a lot because they're so busy with taking in all the details and interacting with things at the same time as the grandfather is speaking. So you know adding subtitles mandatory it's not really a really good solution. Uh, but when people play with subtitles, you know sometimes they actually understand the narrative better. That's what our testing shows, but you can't really force players to have subtitles. And that's that's another issue in VR, like where you play the subtitles. <laughs> yeah. Should they follow me around, or do you play them here and you player have to turn and look at them? So there's these challenges that you have to overcome somehow. Mm -hmm. I was going to say just briefly, I think it's also interesting that maybe we don't have to always embody a character. Um, what I loved about immersive theatre and was going to punch drum shows where a show is happening within this environment, within this building, and it's up to you to weave your own way through this narrative. It's kind of, it's a broken narrative. It's not something that's just happening in a linear order, and you have yeah. to see this and this and this and this and this. Mm -hmm. It's something whereby the show almost loops every hour or something, um, and you can end up picking up on bits on another walkthrough with different spaces. And I think that's quite interesting. Um, to just not think that the story has to start here, have a middle and have an end, um, and it's something I'm quite keen to explore going forward. Yeah, I think the key is to have it linked to your interactions in the game. Mm -hmm. yeah, when they do something, you trigger something about the narrative, so your actions have meaning and you get, mm -hmm. yeah, you progress through the game, basically. That's so interesting, it's almost like hard sci-fi we're talking about right now. <laughs> like, we're, we're getting 
We're trying to find out workarounds uh, to get to believability um, in the most fascinating ways, I think. Mm. Um, I think one of the really interesting things about that and being in this room today is that you know you guys kind of sit here as game developers and there are a lot of people in the audience that are filmmakers. I feel like VR is one day be going to become this industry that maybe brings these two groups here together in some sense and then maybe 10 years down the line. We're not game developers, you're not filmmakers, we are VR creators and we find a common ground where those skill sets match in some way. Would you guys agree with that? Um, yeah, yeah. That's just absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, we're doing great Doctor Who. Whilst there, I kind of see it sitting in between a game, and like for me, I love walking. What are called walking simulators. In, 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 like I don't have forty hours to spend on Zelda. I have like an hour if I'm lucky. And there are these games where essentially a story is happening as you walk through a world. I think what we're trying to do with some sort of I, I mean, my background as well isn't making games, it's sort of working in TV and film. Um, but I work with now a team of people who are from that games world, and we have a, we try and balance the two. There's a, a lot of them fight for like all these gameplay things, and actually sometimes I have to remind them that this is, this is an experience, and the emo how you feel about something is probably more important at this point than the gameplay of, I don't know, how you interact with an object, and, how you learn about what to, how to solve something. So it's just a real balance of the two, uh, I think, <coughs> in VR. Um, 